if suppose you are a legislator you are framing some laws what ethical principles should you keep in your mind highlight three ethical principles tell me uh, recently uh, in the news we had heard about the three uh, some uh, rules new rules which have been proposed for cricket tell me three of the new rules which have been proposed to be uh, brought about in the game of cricket uh, when sir asked you about what reforms you initiated in academics uh, one you mentioned was rfid library what is rfid you were the uh, british introduced the law uh, the act abolition of shafi and which year akhil how are you doing akhil are you fully vaccinated yes sir so the distance is safe you can take off the mask for clarity of expression Akhil, yes. how would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Akhil Vinod. Uh, I hail from Kerala state, uh, from Trichur district. I have done my graduation in B.L.B. honors from National University of the Grand Central Studies in Cochin. And thereafter, uh, I was inducted into the Kerala Administrative Service, the State Civil Service, in the year 2021 in the month of December, which I could not uh, update in the DAC because it was only during the month of December that I was inducted. And my hobbies include. guest blogging on constitutional law and governance and reflective writing sir akhil do you use social media no. you are completely cut off from the social media sir no. um next yes uh, from the preparation time i am not using social media from 2018 to 21 uh, to the least uh, but i am using instant messaging apps like whatsapp and telegram so uh, that's my use of social media sir what are the disadvantages of not being on social media so certainly there are some disadvantages which i agree to um, that is you may not be very much aware of what is happening in terms of the world especially in terms of the youth how it is progressing what are the thought processes that is happening in terms of that and in terms of gaining certain news also social media helps and staying connected to friends that is another important aspect of social media that which we have to give this to okay if i say social media is a double edged sword what do you understand so certainly i would agree with the statement it is a double edged sword because it has got a great potential in terms of connecting people in terms of democratizing the discourse but at the same time uh, we see a lot of fake news that is circulating across the realm of india i think that is one disadvantage of social media and also um, several cyber frauds and even stalking and many other cyber crimes also happen through social media so i think your optional subject is law yes are you a law graduate yes okay have you heard about sealed cover jurisprudence yes. can you elaborate so yes so uh, especially when it comes to those matters which involve certain security concerns of the state it is indeed uh, now a common it is indeed a common practice for the state authorities to grant certain information in the seal cover only for the judicial perusal so that is what seal cover jurisprudence is all about so it is often a criticized doctrine how do you analyze the recent judgment of karnataka high court on hijab yes sir so i would say that um, there are two parts to the judgment firstly when it comes to the positives of the judgment it is always understood uniform as a very important part of schooling system that is you don't need to involve religion into a very secular practice of schooling that is the core understanding of that particular judgment and it also states that when it comes to practice of religion or practice of a particular uh, faith as such there are some reasonable restriction which is which is attached even in article 25 itself which gives religious faith and expression that is this subject to other fundamental rights restriction public order health and morality that is understood as a part of judgment but on the other side it also uses a particular phrase called as a qualified public place for schools which is often criticized why is it a qualified public place and there is also uh, another criticism that has emanated as a part of this judgment that it has ignored the doctrine of reasonable accommodation of certain practices of certain sections as such so i think this is how i analyze a karnataka high court judgment but all of the recommendation can be uh, pursued further the petition was filed around which articles 
So, um, as far as I recollect, it was based on Article 25 as and also Article 90 because it is also one's freedom of expression that is expression in terms of clothing. Um, so, I can't recollect any at this point of time. Yes, sir, certainly, yes, sir. Uh, because Article 21 is considered a catena of all kinds of rights. So, Article 21 is definitely connected, sir. Of Article 21? Um, so, I can't recollect at this point, sir. Have you heard about right to privacy? If suppose you are a legislator, you are framing some laws, what ethical principles should you keep in your mind? Highlight three ethical principles. So, firstly, I feel that each and every law should have empathy to the vulnerable section. That is one aspect that I would always keep in mind. That is, it should not compromise the rights of the poorest of poor of this country. Second principle would be objectivity. That is, that particular law should be objectively correct, but also be accommodative of certain interests that I have mentioned in the first thing. And thirdly, I feel that any particular law should shield all ways of corruption. So it should be um, it should be very complete in terms of not giving any avenues for corruption. So minimizing discretion. That would be. Uh, another aspect of it. Okay. Uh, I was going through your dash and I found out that you have never been employed. Have you ever been employed? Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to may, may place a very important information before the board that in December 2021, I was inducted into the Kerala Administrative Service, that is the State Civil Service of Kerala. Um, so now I am undergoing training under that. Between 2018 and 2021, when um, you, the time that you are highlighting when you were inducted, between that time period, you never worked anywhere. Yes, then it is giving an impression as if you lack first hand industry experience. And you know that industry experience is considered as a key skill set in modern day administration. Would you like to defend yourself, Akhil, on that? I agree to the fact that industry experience is absolutely important one. But at the same time, there is also a freshness that a fresh graduate brings into a picture when it comes to bureaucracy. There are fresh ideas which would come across. So I think certainly on that aspect, um, I can contribute well to the administration. What can bureaucrats learn from the corporate sector? So, uh, the first thing would be efficiency. Uh, that is how things are done at a fast pace and at a much lesser rate. So I think that is one thing that we could absolutely learn. Second is professionalism. You have played or you have participated in inter college cricket competition. Yes, sir. You what was your role in the cricket team? Yes. Okay. You batted at what position? I batted as number four. Who is your favorite number four batsman of all time? He is famous for? Sir, so, it's straight drive that is most wonderful. Are you following the ongoing IPL? No, sir. Uh, I just used to check sports, not further than that. Do you have any idea how this year's format is different from the previous years? Sir, so, uh, I know that there are two teams which are added. Apart from that, I am not very aware of the rules as such. Teams into groups? Uh, I haven't checked on this, sir. Matches are out government? I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Akhil, tell me, what is the meaning of the name Akhil? It, it, it derives from a Sanskrit uh, origin. It says that it is complete. Good. Uh, your date of birth was 8th of December, right? Uh, do you share your birthday with uh, any people of prominence? Uh, I'm not very sure of it. Okay. Uh, 
No, one reason uh, uh, your date of birth uh, interested me was it was the birthday of one of our uh, heroes of the Indian Air Force. Uh, later on, we'll add as an air marshal, Trevor Keeler. Okay, so that is what interested me. Okay, and uh, have you heard this name? Sorry, sir, I haven't heard it. Okay. This is your third attempt in civil services. And the first time you come to the interview stage, where did you uh, fall short in the first two attempts in 19 and 20? Yes, sir. Uh, in 2019, I failed in the very first thing that is the prelims itself. Uh, because I think there were some inadequacies in terms of my prelims preparation. So in 2020, I was able to go across the prelims stage, but I fell short in ways. So in 2021, I was able to rectify that. You have already joined the, the state civil services. Uh, you are much better prepared for uh, this year's uh, uh, interview now. So I would say that mentally I'm in a better state. Uh, you said you were the school head boy. Uh, was it a, a post which you were elected for or selected for? It was a post that I was selected for by the teachers and the administration. What? into the selection process? There are a couple of factors. That is my involvement in terms of being a co-curricular captain in my 11th standard, um, that leadership role and how I was able to nurture the talents across the students in the school. So that was one factor that went in my favor. Secondly, it was my academic performance during the year. You said the leadership role. Now tell me, uh, where all do you think you have exhibited your leadership uh, skills? Um, school and later. The so school, I would say that uh, my involvement as a head boy and my involvement as a co curricular captain was, uh, was uh, an exhibition of leadership role. But I would say that predominantly it was during my college days that I exclude myself as an individual. Um, in the college day, I was college days, I was able to organize a legal aid camp in Atta Party, which is a tribal taluk in Kerala. Um, so there, I think I was able to get across a team and understand the tribal issues and, separate, and submit a memorandum before the government, which I think was an exhibition of my leadership skill. And secondly, I was also a university senate member. Mem member. I was co-opted by the vice chancellor with the concurrence of the students' council. And even during that tenure, I think I was able to significantly contribute to the academic standards as well as the extracurricular standards of my institution. Okay. You also said that uh, uh, you helped improve the academic standards. How did you do that? What did you do differently? Um, there are two things uh, that we have done. That is our library time. When, when I joined the institution, that was in 2013, it was restricted to 7 p.m. So it was not very conducive for the learning of these scholars at that point. So what we did was that we extended the library time to 11 p.m. Uh, so it was pioneered by the team which was headed by me, the proposal as such. And we also introduced the system of RFID in libraries so that uh, the things that is issuing of books and other things happen smoothly. So that was also initiated by us. And apart from that, we also ensured that each and every project that was submitted before the university was scrutinized for plagiarism. And that was under the request of the student body, which is a very new thing as far as uh, the university was concerned. That students itself pushing for rigorous academic standards. Okay, you also uh, you played cricket in school or college? In college, yeah. Okay. Uh, tell me, uh, recently uh, in the news, we had heard about the three uh, some uh, rules, new rules which have been proposed for cricket. Tell me three of the new rules which have been proposed to be uh, brought about in the game of cricket. Um, so. I'm not very sure of the three new rules that you're referring to. So, no, there are many rules. And I just asked for three. Um, so, three rules in terms of ODI cricket. There are some rules which are being proposed. That is, uh, that ODI can be played as innings. That is, 25, 25, and later on, uh, so that can generate more. The new rules which have already been brought into place. So, uh, are you referring to the system of power plays which are introduced, which is some years later? No, I'm just talking about some new rules which have been uh, approved by the MCC very, very recently. Uh, 
uh, if you can tell me, is there any rule in cricket which has not changed since inception of the game? Most of the rules have uh, changed over the period of time. One rule which has not changed ever, which is it? Sir, I think it is the system of being bold. I think that has not changed. Yeah. Are you sure? That is what I recollect. Uh, recently, uh, the Indian woman played uh, played in the ODI World Cup. Uh, how was India's performance in uh, the Women's World Cup, and which teams uh, have entered the finals? Sir, again, I'm not aware of it. Sir. Okay. Uh, Recently, there was a term which was floated by the French president when he talked in terms of Finlandization, referring to the Ukraine uh, Russia war. Tell me about it. What is it? So, as far as I understand, it is a doctrine of neutrality that he was talking about, which stands very compromised at this point of time. That is, even when we are talking about neutrality, that neutrality is not very much objective in nature. That is, it is very compromised in terms of one's own national interest. That is what I think Finlandization refers to. In your order of preference, you have placed the zone 2, that is Bihar, Jharkhand, Odisha and Uttar Pradesh, last in the order of preference. Can you give me any explanation for that please? Um, so firstly, my preference was mostly marked in terms of my own affinities and how I can gel in terms of the culture of the state, in terms of my own understanding. So that is why I think uh, those states came last. Uh, so that, that is how my order of preference was marked. Because uh, for the second zone, I opted for Rajasthan, uh, Rajasthan zone, because a lot of my friends are there. So I thought that I can most probably understand the culture better. So I think that was one reason which fueled my marking of preferences. Sir. One last question. You are a law graduate, right? So Indian corporate law service uh, is very low down in the order of your preference, much below the IRS also. Why? Sir, firstly, I would like to state that my understanding and my interest in terms of corporate law is very limited when compared to other laws like constitutional law and criminal law. So I think that is one thing which did not attract me to the service as such, because I think law is a broad swing and your interest varies. So I don't think that corporate law is that big a factor to draw me close to it. How does the, the revenue service become a precedence higher than uh, the other thing? Uh, in terms of revenue service, it is based on the inputs that I have received from many seniors that I have come across. It. it is a very good service to be part of in terms of your work profile, in terms of things that you can do, in, ter in terms of the things that you can contribute to. So that is why I marked it higher. Thank you, Akhil. Akhil, you belong, belong to Chisu. Uh, what is the current sex ratio in Chisu? Current future, um, as to the exam, it's 1048 is 2000. 1048, what is 1019? So, I think I'm a bit confused on that. Uh, my question is uh, why Kerala overall has a better sex ratio than other states? So, um, there are a couple of factors which drive Kerala to having a better sex ratio. Firstly, there is a greater sensitization with regard to um, with regard to selection of child assets. That is, sex selection is considered as a very uh, as a grave crime across the state. So that is one factor. And secondly, there is a greater gender parity as such, which happens in terms of families at least, at least during the growing up stages. So uh, if, even if it is a boy or a girl, treated as a treasure. So that is the kind of culture that the state is always put across. And thirdly, there is a great governmental effort which has gone in in terms of sensitizing the parents about the need to equally promote girl and boy children. So I think that is one factor. Okay. Are you aware of Chimoni wildlife sanctuary? Yes, sir. Can you name top three species of um, Sir, in Chimoni, sir, I don't think that I can recollect it. 
uh, tell me three prominent industrial issues of Kerala. Firstly, we had a history of militant trade unionism in Kerala. So I think that has always drove industries away from Kerala. There was also a recent Kitex issue wherein an industry opted to move away from Kerala to Telangana, which also played up a great amount of interest in terms of uh, media, uh, media attention in terms of that. So I think that is one factor, that is militant trade unionism. Secondly, there is environmental fragility that is always attached to the state of Kerala. So there is no, uh, we, there can't be a greater allocation of land which can be given to industry because of the environmental fragility that is associated with it. And thirdly, there is an increased labor cost that is seen across Kerala. So there is a trend of migrant labors coming across to Kerala and they are treated as guest workers uh, by the nomenclature that is, associated, that is given by the state. So I think these are the three factors which is always acted as a concern for the industrial sector in Kerala. You talked about uh, militant uh, trade unionism. Are you responsible for that? No, sir. I won't um, attribute that to communism as such because even at this point of time, uh, Kerala is ruled by a democratically elected communist government. So, even though there was trade unionism to the great extent, uh, there was something called as a gawking labor cost, which used to be charged, which was abolished by the new, newly elected communist government. So, I think um, more than an ideology being a driving factor for that, I would say that it was a political culture that was responsible for militant trade unionism at some point of time. But it has receded to a great extent. Now even the Kerala government has come out with several labor reform measures like the cases that are centralized inspection system wherein even industries are given um, an assurance that they are, uh, they are premises won't be inspected even without giving show posts. The architect of non-aligned movement in India. So I would say that it is Pandit Jawala Nehru. Or VK Krishna Menon. So, um, though both can be held as a part of it, I would say that it is Jawala Nehru's ideology which was a driving force behind it. What do you know about VK Krishna Menon? So, uh, VK Krishna Menon, I would say that the first thing that comes to my mind is that he's a native of Kerala from the Koriko district. And after that, he is also known for giving one of the longest speech in UN that ran to eight hours, and he was also a defense minister uh, for this for, for our country. So I think these are the things that I know about him. And after the China war, um, he was held responsible for certain decisions which fell out of place, and he had to go. Okay. Have you heard about force majeure uh, in combat? Yes, sir. What is it? So, the is when certain natural calamities or unforeseen things happens, and because of that, contract stands frustrated. Uh, so, it can be uh, considered as a reason for impossible circumstance of contract and to avoid it. So, it automatically comes into force or it needs a deliberate mention in the contract? No, it automatically comes into force as per section 56 of the Indian Contract Act. Uh, you organized a camp for uh, tribal town in Kerala. Okay. Uh, are you aware about the recent uh, Samadhan doctrine provided by the uh, government of India that to deal with tribalism? Yes, sir. What is that? Can you elaborate on that? So, uh, though I can't elaborate on the acronym as such because I can't repeat it, Samadhan doctrine is a strategy which is initiated by government of India in order to incorporate smart policing strategy as well as confidence building measures as a part of capacity building of tribals as such to deal with Naxalism. So it is considered as a synergy of both these methods. Fundamental difference between Panchil and Samadhan? Sir, I would say uh, there is no ideological difference as such, but when it comes to Panchil, it is more tribal centric in nature. That is the way that we need to involve with the tribals, the way that we need to deal, deal away with the idea of mainstreaming. So, I think these are the things which forms the core focus of Panchi, but when it comes to Samadhan, there is a focus that is given to dealing with Naxalism. Okay. One last question from my side. Uh, in the service preference, the custom and excise servants service uh, finds precedence over income tax. What is the reason? Uh, sir, it is my uh, liking for a uniform service over a job that involves a more, I would say that um, when you are being placed in IRSIT, 
it was informed my seniors that we will be having a desk job. So my preference uh, for a uniform service and more field oriented work. So that is what uh, placed uh, customs over IT. One last question. Uh, when sir asked you about what reforms you initiated in academics, uh, one you mentioned was RFID in library. What is RFID? So it's a um, it's a mechanism of identification wherein it is a mechanism of identification wherein you just um, need to scan through a barcode in order to make a recognition in the system. RFID. What do you think both are fundamentally different? Yes, but I can't go into the technicalities of it because I'm not aware of it. So you, you wanted to say barcode and not RFID. I think it's RFID. Barcode was a mistake from my part. RFID was a mistake on your part. Okay, it is actually barcode. It is RFID, sir. It is RFID scanner. That's what I know of it. Right. When I'm trying to explain it, uh, because I don't know about the technicalities of RFID. So I think I uh, misinterpreted it with uh, Baku. Very sorry. Sure. The population of uh, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar approximately. I think it is 26 crore. Um, Bihar, I am not sure of it, sir. I think it is somewhere between 10 to 12 crores. It's around 30, uh, 34 crore. We can say uh, 34, 36 crore. So your option is the zone uh, fifth to serve in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. So you would not like to serve the 26 crore population. Yes, sir. Um, certainly, I feel that uh, if you're opting for Indian administrative service or any kind of service, which is a pan India service, you should be willing to serve in each and every part of India. But this is just my order of preference as such. Uh, I don't have any kind of inhibition to serve in any part of India, sir. Say hypothetically, if you have been allocated this zone 5 service, the NG agency service, you born and brought up in Kerala. What are the experience from your life or you see have you have seen in the Kerala administration and who would like to replicate in uh, one of your districts in zone 5? Yes, sir. Uh, when it comes to Kerala, there are two factors which always stands out. Though Kerala is not known for big industries and all, there is something called as Kerala model of development, which is considered as a model as such. That is building on the capacity of people. That is something that Kerala has exhibited as a strength. That is in terms of education and health. That is something that I would also try down. And secondly, capacitating the local government. In 1996, Kerala experimented with a people's plan campaign that is uh, uh, devolving funds to the local government and capacitating local government and through that coming out with a development plan. So I think these are the two things that I would like to experiment in those states if I'm allocated there. What is the literacy rate of Kerala? Sir, it is somewhere around 93%. Okay, and the independence, uh, what is the literacy rate of Kerala? Um, so I think it was around 70 to 80%. percent i am not very sure of it. Sir. 70 to 80%? percent so at least I think in my district, it was uh, somewhere around that. I'm not, I'm not sure of it. Sir. I, why the Kerala is one of the uh, most uh, literate state in India? Sir, there are several factors. I would first start with history. That is, even when it came to the traveling. Yes, tell me the post independence. Post independence, sir. Certainly, the investment that has gone into the public education system in Kerala that has always played a part. Even at this point of time, a state government is actively spending in something called as uh, public educational schooling system. That is the scheme. That is how it is named, uh, and actively spending on it. That is one factor. Secondly, there is a greater sensitization among parents which has always pushed education as a very important facet of child's upbringing. And thirdly, I would say that there is land reform which has played a significant part. Because land reform has capacitated the lower caste and middle caste in Kerala. And by that way, they were also capacitated in terms of capital in order to influence the child's education and health. I think these are the three factors which has always played a part. What is the relevance of law in society? When it is required, when uh, it is not required? So, uh, I would say that law is always required, but the way that we apply law in society, that has to change in terms of different situations. Because law is that which governs the order of a society. How an orderly society can be organized, that is the part that law has to play. So, I think law always plays a part, but at times, um, law has to be tempered with enough exceptions, enough subjectivity, so that it serves the cause of justice.
where the uh, British introduced the law, uh, the act, abolition of Shati, and which year? Um, so I can't recollect. Sir, I think it was 1838. Is it, is it still required in India? So I would say that certainly things have changed in India. That is the way that self-immolation is construed in our society that has changed. Uh, so I think gradually that law, uh, because that law uh, has served its purpose, it can go away. Like you said that law is required, it's uh, every, every time it is present in society. Yes, the law is required. In order to govern the society in an orderly fashion. Because at that point of time in history, that law was needed. But at this point, when our civil society is sensitized enough to understand that this is a grave enough crime, I think that we don't need the power or the victim of law to govern that in our society. And we have to introduce uh, post -point. So, um, it, it was because of two factors. That is, firstly, even in Article 15, children are treated differently because they have to be given special protection under the constitution itself. And secondly, there were greater crimes which are registered against children, done, perpetrated against children. So these are the factors which necessitated the government to come up with a POPSO Act, which is very much needed at that point of time. The name the act which is applicable to, uh, to maintain the gender, gender balance in the society. Um, so, So, if I can take a bit of time. So, starting with the NDT Act, which is an act which um, caters to the idea of sex selective ab uh, abortion. So, that is one act which is needed. Please and well about sex selective abortion. So, there are a couple of factors, especially in parts of India. Uh, girl children are considered as estranged wealth. So that is one factor because even an economic survey I think in 2019 made a reference to some meta preference that is happening in certain states in India. So I think these are factors which always drive the parents to believe that having a son is always treated as a wealth but having a daughter may be treated as an estranged wealth. So um, sexuality, abortion sadly happens in India. Okay, what, uh, who is the uh, uh, Delhi's demolition man? Um, sir, um, as far as I understand it is, uh, it was Alphonse Kandandana, who is uh, an officer of the Indian Administrative Service, who hails from the state of Kerala. Contribution to improve the education in Kerala. Sir, in terms of improving education in Kerala, I'm saying that certainly we have come out with NGOs and standards like... As an administrative officer. As an administrative officer, I'm not aware of it, sir. Akhil, just a couple of questions before we wind this thing up. You must be aware, a few years ago, there was a talk in Kerala that the government will impose a fat tax. Do you have any idea about it? Yeah. Fat tax, I think it was mooted in the year 2015-16 by then Finance Minister Thomas Isaac uh, on particular commodities that we consume, like burgers, sandwiches, and all, which has these added elements of cheese and other things. These were construed as luxury items. That is why government thought that it was prudent to tax them, firstly on the grounds of health, secondly it can also augment the revenue reserves of the state. Was this tax going against the principles of equality? Sir, uh, I would say that it won't go against the principle of equality as such because it's a kind of a taxation which affects um, those who can afford those kinds of food items as such. But uh, I would say that it affects one's freedom to choose, that is uh, penalizing a particular food choice, I don't think that it is a very prudent step from a state. You are saying that it was attacking liberty to some extent, but not equality. It was attacking liberty to some extent, but in terms of equality, I think state was uh, within its own discretion to come out with a law which can tax certain food items. Affordability was the ground on the basis of which classification was made. Yes, I think even uh, the GST slabs that we have come out with, that has also affordability as one point which uh, proves to be a tax classification. So I think that is justified. Indian traditional sweets, was this tax imposed on that? And can the poor afford it? 
So uh, as far as I recollect, um, most of the Indian traditional sweets available in Kerala were exempted because it was particularly targeted at certain MNCs, especially like McDonald's, mm -hmm. uh, Domino's, etc. So I think most of these sweet joints were out of the purview of that particular legislation as such. But I think um, later on, uh, upon greater deliberation, it was rolled back. To reform your statement now, it was not the principle of equality was not imposed there. Classification was made as you're referring to uh, equal protection of the laws. Then the basis of classification was not affordability, but Indian or foreign food providers. So I would say that affordability would have played a part, uh, though I would agree to your statement that that was not the sole criterion as such, Indian or foreign was also an important criterion. But I would say that that satisfied the question of individual differentiator that forms a core part of classification principle as laid down in Article 40. And it also had a reasonable nexus that is sought to be achieved by that particular legislation that is improving the tax reserves of the state. So I think on these counts, I think um, Article 40 classification principle stands satisfied and it is not breached per se, but I, I shall certainly think about it. Akhil, one final question. Yeah. If law creates a void, ethics fills it. If ethics creates a void, what fills it? So if law creates a void, ethics fills it, uh, because I uh, subscribe to that statement, especially considering uh, issues like marital rape. Law is not providing for it, but having an ethical mindset, we understand that it's a very great crime. But when ethics is void, I think nothing can fill it. Because ethics is what makes a human being, ethics is what defines a society. If it is not there, the society cannot be organized in a fashion that we know. And in a good society where everyone is uh, ethics abiding, I don't think that even law is needed. But law is needed in a pragmatic society for orderly governance. How do you read this statement? When ethics creates a void, conscience fills it. So, um, I would certainly agree to it, but I think. As a person, for me, ethics and conscience are very much integrated. And my voice of conscience is my ultimate focus. Thank you, Akhil. Your interview is over. We will reconnect with you in some time for your feedback. Thank you. Let me highlight the good things first, dear. You appear very polite. You have very good communication skills. You articulate your arguments very well. Your thoughts are organized. Your opinion is balanced. You have good command over law, ethics, these kind of areas, which reflects well on your choice of optional subject as well as it also gives a, a kind of justification why you went for these subjects in your graduation. But this is a critical analysis here. So let us jump to those areas where there is enough room for improvement. First thing is when you entered this room, you should never say this statement, may I sit. This is not a test of your knowledge. This is a test of your personality. Certain things are being checked, whether you are disciplined, whether you have balance of opinion, whether you have an inquisitive nature. Are you a problem solver? Do you have intellectual depth? How alert are you? These things are being checked, right? These aspects of your personality. It gave an impression as if you cannot wait for orders You jump into the situation. You get that? So never do that. Stand beside the chair and you will be definitely asked to sit down. You get that? Yes. Second, do you intend to wear the same combination on the day of interview? I would suggest against it. Always in such kind of interviews, you should go for a darker pant and a lighter shade shirt so that if you wear to a necktie then it is more vibrant the necktie should always be of a darker color when compared to the shirt in such uh, a scenario brown shoes if you are wearing a black pant or a navy blue pant i would say go for black shoes rather than brown shoes and laced shoes they are more formal right avoid the watch because this is not allowed in the interview hall. So start practicing without a watch. Then 
your hair is not kept properly. So try to do that. It should not hang over your forehead. It gives a clumsy look, right? So try to work on that. Eye movement was good at times, but in few occasions, uh, you were not looking at all the members of the group. When somebody asked you a question, look into that person's eyes, wait for the question to get over. Once the question is finished, still do not start answering right from the word go. Why? Because there could be a supplementary question following that question. So wait for that question. Or there could be an explanation further to that question. Many times you interrupted while we were in the process of asking the question. So this shows your lack of patience. Do you get that? So try to avoid that mistake here. So wait for the question to get over. Once the question is over, slightly lower your gaze. It gives an impression as if you're processing your thoughts. Do not put your head down. That shows lack of confidence. Then take your head high again and start answering by looking at the person who has asked you the question. Primarily look towards that person. But meanwhile, look at other members of the board as well. So that they do not feel offended or they do not feel left out. The hand movement was not at all appropriate. It was too excessive. In fact, you were keeping your hands like this on the armrest and you were sitting on the edge of the seat. It gave an impression as if you are ready to move out. Do you get that? The right way of sitting, Akhil, is your spinal cord should touch the back of your seat. Look now. You look very attentive immediately. Right? And the hands, how you have placed them now is fine. In between, you can also lock your fingers. But do not hold your fingers loosely, otherwise you will start playing with your fingers. So lock your fingers very tightly, right? Or you can hold your hand like this. But never sit like this on the edge of the seat. It created an impression as if you are too much overawed by the scenario and you want to get out immediately. Then eyebrows. There was excessive movement of eyebrows at times, as if you were talking to some friends. Right? So avoid that as well. Some of your answers were very good. I liked your answers, which were around social media, around law, around your hobby. You answered that area as well. One answer in particular, which I liked, I liked was the militant labor unionism, how you handled that without getting into a trap. Once you started answering about the order of preference for state card within Zoom, there you, in the first part, you used some words like affinity, friends. These are not correct, right? And in fact, Sir got you when he asked about the uh, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar population. There you made the course correction. The right answer should be, Sir, I have just exercised my preferences, but I'm more than willing to serve anywhere in any capacity. That shows your dedication towards public services as a foundational value of civil services. You understand that? Do not use such words, affinity, friends. Then it gives an impression that you are looking for a job only. Then the corporate sector is a better op option there. Also, uh, your answer was not satisfactory when you were trying to answer IRS. Answer asked you about corporate law service. You placed it seven. You said that I am more uh, inclined towards the uniform services. Those services which give an opportunity to wear the uniform. Then why IPS your third reference? There is a clear contradiction. It means that you are not thinking before you are speaking again. You get that, dear? I hope you will take this feedback very positively because the ultimate aim is to assist you to go into the services. Otherwise, you are a bright prospect. And I have a hunch you are making it. Right? That's my feedback, sir. Okay. You made a little apprehensive entry, but then later on I could see your confidence and that confidence probably came from, from the fact that you are already in employment. So, good. keep up that confidence. Don't be apprehensive when you enter. What can happen? You are already in a good job. So, let the confidence be right from the beginning till the end. Dress right? uh, has been said, hairdo has been said, smile, very good smile, keep it up and uh, maintain it through, but don't overdo it. Right? It's very important to remember that. Uh, communication skills good, facial expressions were far too excessive. You know, it almost felt as if you were on the verge of dramatics. So don't dramatize. When you, you keep a cool face, uh, you know, don't, we don't, you don't have to over exaggerate our uh, emotions. Eye contact was recent, but you ignored the people in the corners. So it felt a little uh, occlusive. 
knowledge of cricket was uh, from Latin. It felt, uh, you said you played cricket at uh, the college level and uh, you know, the new rules which have come up there uh, in cricket, uh, one rule which has not changed is the length of the pitch. Right? That has not changed at all. The rest, everything has changed. So, uh, remember that. Then, uh, in one instance I saw, when uh, a question was asked to you about, when he asked about, uh, you know, when he started talking about history, and then he said, no, post-independence. Then you repeated the question, oh, post-independence. So, that is not uh, to be done. Uh, when is your interview slated for? You have, uh, you made a course correction, all right, but that was too late actually. By that time, you know, some people would have already taken the comments of the fact that you said something very, very drastically wrong. Unless you course correct immediately, it may uh, probably do well. So, remember that. And uh, in one instance, the last point which I wanted to make was, I felt as if you went into a confrontation mode when he was talking about the barcode and RFID. It felt as if you are going on the confrontation uh, zone. Avoid that. We are not here to debate. Right? You are here just to express your point. In case somebody is trying to brush you the wrong way, just withdraw from the. Don't uh, unnecessarily get on with what you are saying and what is right, because it may get it may get you some negative uh, marks, and that is not what we are here for. Right. So you yourself will be your worst victim or uh, worst uh, uh, performer. So make sure that you don't get into a confrontation mode, come what may. Otherwise, you have excellent chances of making this. I can assure you. All the very best. Akhil, see Akhil, uh, positives are already highlighted. Uh, your articulation of thoughts were very good. Your smile is very good. Industrial issues of Kerala question was handled very well. Some points which I would like to you improve upon is at initial stages you were not speaking very clearly it may be because of your accent but try to speak clearly whatever you want to say that has to be uh, that should reach the listener properly in the same fashion okay a uh, hand movement was a uh, bit on the negative side excessive hand movement at some places and your hand was like this okay so avoid that Facial expressions were very excessive, as rightly pointed out by Sir. And at one place, you also, uh, when Sir asked you a question about uh, date of birth, and Sir highlighted you some significance of that date, you said, Is it, Sir? Mm. Thank mm. you. Is it? That is an informal expression, it's a way of talking. So avoid that. Uh, and in case of RFID, you unnecessarily got into confrontation. Uh, RFID is actually used on cars. You know that, that fast tag, that is RFID. I think you were talking about, or you wanted to talk about barcode. Uh, I, I don't know the technicalities of it, but uh, it is booted as an RFID scanner. It is installed as an RFID scanner. So we did not. We only went for the purchase of it, but we don't know the actual functioning of it. So that's what I was trying to clarify, but it did not come across in the right fashion. Also, uh, I did not. Uh, uh, there was another uh, point of confrontation as well. Uh, that was professionalism. You said that private companies, professionalism should be should come in government services as well. Uh, they're coming early and going late, leaving late. So is coming early and leaving late a sign of professionalism? No. no. It is not at all a sign of professionalism. Okay, so don't use such kind of statements where you could get crap. Otherwise, you have a bright prospect this year. <laughs> See, when I ask you the question, particularly about the law in the society, will it be there when it is required, when it is not required? Understand? My question is like, what are you doing? What you do? Change it. Why do you change it? There is no need to change it. When I ask that about the revolution of Sati, being a law student, you must be aware that when law is required, when it is not required. So I will ask about the ethics. It's the same. The problem over the marital that we were uh, telling about that. At present, there is no law to govern the marital way. But if it is required, then we will, uh, it will be placed. But after some time, it is not required. You understand? This is a clear intuition. Uh, I also asked about uh, other things. Literacy rate. 
in Kerala. See, I of course I asked about the literature reading with us and I asked about the writing. The question is related about the comparative aspect when the literacy rate in Kerala was high. At which period? What are the what were the strategies the government uh, did in that time? You went to one of the history section. See, it's the independence. So what is the literacy rate in all over India? You bluff it. That's just uh, 60, 40 percent. Kerala only. You are you sure that there is 64 percent, 65 percent? 64 percent you mentioned. 60, 70 something. 60, 70. 72. Yes, sir. I, 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 I asked. So are you correct? In fact, uh, I, I thought, yes, sir. I thought that in Travancore at least it was some 60. Sorry, sir. Okay. At that time, it was a princely state or something like that. So, so always, you know, that's the question you should try to avoid if you don't have a fact in your hand. Otherwise, your communication skill is good, okay, to answer so many uh, questions correctly, even you uh, recall your mistake about uh, startup, uh, everything is good, uh, please for you for your future. Akhil, a couple of more things which I wanted to highlight. One is, do you intend to wear the same glasses? Are you comfortable in it? Yes. Okay. Uh, if you plan to change, go for a rimless one. It it gives a more formal impression, right? If you're comfortable with this, then do not change it. If you have no inhibitions, then you can go for it. Second, I asked you something about who is your number four favorite batsman. And what did you say? Did I say test batsman? I'm not interested who is your number four favorite batsman. My interest lies in whether you're listening and if you are not clear with the question, do you ask for a supplementary question? Suppose you get a God, get some orders from chief secretary and you give a reply. Is that kind of a thing? You get it? So always ask for such clarity. In fact, you ask, when sir asked you that rules, you said sir in ODI. So always ask sir in ODI, T20 or uh, test cricket. I mean, anything specific you would like to ask before I disclose your marks? You have performed well despite these areas and we have done a very hard scrutiny because we want you to go into that coveted service. Your first choice is Indian Administrative Service. You have already made it to the state services. Now I think that you will make this year into the Indian Administrative Services. I have a strong hunch as I said earlier. As far as this performance was concerned, the board has awarded you 180 to 185. Specifically speaking, you can take it as 182.5, right? which is very good. But if you work on these areas, you are definitely a 200 plus candidate. Thank you.